Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us. We have a lot to cover today, including that we're going to be live in a major case out of Florida. Let's break it all down. First up, we're going to be back in verdict watch in the penalty phase of the McStay family murder trial. After the jury delivered what many are calling a shocking verdict, namely finding Charles Merritt guilty of four counts of first degree murder, that same jury will have to determine his punishment, life in prison or the death penalty. There is a lot at stake for the man responsible for the slayings of Joseph McStay, his wife Summer, and their two sons, Gianni and Joseph Jr. Both sides delivered their closing arguments with the defense presenting for about an hour and 20 minutes. Afterwards, the jury began their deliberations, which lasted for about two hours. They're going to be back today at 1130 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. But I want to let you know, due to a scheduling issue, they're only going to be able to deliberate for two hours. No wonder this trial has been going on since January. Next up, we talked earlier about the outrageous trial of James Scandarito Jr., the man who was found not guilty of murdering his father, but he was convicted of chopping up his father's body and disposing of the remains. I'm sure many of you out there remember this feel-good trial. Well, his sentencing is today, and he could face up to 15 years in prison. In anticipation of today, we've been revisiting this case by replaying some of the more memorable moments of that trial, including, again, I'll say it once, I'll say it again, the craziest testimony I think I've ever seen. I'm talking about when the defendant took the stand and admitted to what he did in detail. I've never seen anything like it. But that just lets us think, who knows what we can expect later when the sentencing begins at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're definitely not going to want to miss that one. Right now, though, we want to focus on the dramatic conclusion to the murder trial of 26-year-old Christopher Vasada, who was accused of killing three people in a horrific shooting that took place on Super Bowl Sunday two years ago. Uh, he was charged uh, as well with attempted first degree murder, grand theft auto, and a firearms count. Both sides delivered their closing arguments yesterday, the prosecution arguing that the defendant participated in an ambush shooting that claimed the lives of Sean Henry, Kelly Doherty, and Brandy El Sahi, while they were all just hanging out at a friend's house, that of Charles Vorpagel. The defense argued that the prosecution may have presented exhibits, but not much of evidence proving that Fasada was a shooter or even intended to kill anyone that night. Well, after two and a half hours of deliberation, the jury came back with their verdict. And what a verdict it was. Let's throw to it right now. Okay, so he was found guilty across the board, not just of uh, first degree murder, but also attempted murder and grand theft auto. I want to break it all down right now with criminal defense attorney Michael Troiano. Michael, great to have you here on the Long Crime Network. And I want to just start right now with understanding what this jury came back with. Tell me if I'm wrong. They believe that he was a shooter. They believe he opened fire. They believe he shot and killed Sean Henry, but they didn't believe that he was the one who actually gunned down these two women. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, it's an interesting way in which that they broke down uh, their verdict. Uh, when you break down the evidence and what occurred that evening and the way in which the prosecution presented it, uh, it's clear that he was there. It's clear that he possessed weapons, firearms. There was ammunition that was found on him. And quite frankly, based upon uh, the quote unquote ambush aspect of this case, it looks like the victims just never saw it coming. Let me ask you, were you surprised by this verdict? Because, you know, this, this long crime is so interesting. We see a prosecution closing argument very strong, and then I see the defense's closing argument, and it, I don't know, it raised some good reasonable doubt. Were you thinking, were you surprised by this? I wasn't surprised about uh, him ultimately being held responsible for the actions that occurred that night. Based upon the evidence that I viewed during the trial and the evidence that was presented, was it absolutely clear beyond a reasonable doubt to me that he was the actual shooter? Not necessarily, but he was there. He was there with at least one other, if not multiple other parties. And again, this wasn't uh, a drug deal gone bad or an argument after one too many cocktails or some narcotics in their system. It looks as if they came in there with one mission, which was to murder the people that were there, take the guns, take the drugs, and you know, make a sale at that point. Yeah, we learned more about the prosecution's case against this defendant. Really, it was summed up so nicely in their closing argument. Let's throw to that right now. And the jury followed suit. They found them guilty. Now, Michael, one of the things was that the prosecution really put on a strong case that this guy's DNA was everywhere. It was on these key pieces of evidence. He's next to a BMW that has a rifle case in it. There's bullets in his pocket. 
He's linked to the getaway car, the murder weapons. I thought it was interesting when the defense said, okay, his DNA might be all there. He might even have been there. He was shot. We can't deny that. But just because his DNA is on guns and just because he's there doesn't mean that he had the intent to kill anybody. He had the intent to go there and negotiate. And he was shot in the, in the process. What would you think of that defense? I mean, sometimes as a defense attorney, you're quite frankly not left with many options. So sitting here today as an analyst, I'm not in the position to, quote unquote, criticize exactly what they went with, because you are limited to exactly what you can argue. We knew he was there. We knew he had weapons. We knew he had bullets found on him. We, he was shot. Uh, we knew he was uninvited to the party. Uh, which he tried to claim otherwise, but uh, the owner of the home testified uh, and as the prosecution star witness. So I feel like once you get put in a box in a certain position as a defense team, you've got to be creative. So although it was a stretch, I feel like it was on one of their only avenues of defense. And the other idea was that this putting the blame on Luke Kasukis, who is a person who's been he's not has he hasn't been charged in connection with the shooting. He's been implicated here and there. That theory didn't work out so well for them, even though the prosecution said in their closing, there's possible there's a third shooter, and maybe that th third shooter will one day get justice. There'll be justice uh, for, for in regards to that third shooter. But the jury wasn't thinking about that, were they? No, not in this particular circumstance, because they did not find them guilty under what we call co-conspirator liability, where you are liable for the actions of the people that you're with during the commission of the crime. They found him directly responsible for the crime. Yeah, no. And, and do you think it was also the fact that he was in constant contact with Charles Vorpagel, and he was also in contact with his co-conspirator, uh, his accomplice, excuse me, uh, Marcus Stewart, the fact that they linked him with these phone conversations that they were all in the same kind of group, that why would, it wasn't as if he was a complete stranger. No, it, it's not as if they could really argue with a straight face at the trial that uh, Lasada was some sort of tag along that was just there for the night to score or get high. Right. He was an active participant and uh, the jury saw right through that. Now the jury has to decide what his fate is gonna be. Uh, that'll happen, I believe, on June 26th. Uh, what's the likelihood that they will recommend the death penalty here? Wow, to get myself in the head of a juror, that's uh, something that I wish I could do. It certainly would help my practice. Um, it's a cold-blooded killing, so it, it, I would venture to think that uh, death is a high probability, but again, you never know. We've got to look into the minds of those individuals when they get in that room and basically try to view from their uh, perspective how they view the evidence. I, I think it's clear they felt that he was directly and almost solely responsible for this. So um, if I had to bet, I would say that death is highly likely. One argument is they deliberated for two and a half hours. Pretty short time for them to make a decision. So who knows, they might be really already thinking about the death penalty. There's a defense attorney appealing to the juror's common sense and understanding of what this case is about and that there's alternative theories. Michael, what did you make of that? I, I, there's a part of me that feels, you know what? She's making a good point. Maybe a lot of this is speculation. Maybe there is reasonable doubt. Your thoughts? Absolutely. It's a great point to raise. And what you're trying to do in your closing arguments is spear and wrap up the facts and circumstances of the case in the best light for your defense and present that to the jury. Hopefully they take those arguments and discussions into the jury room and that leads to reasonable doubt. But the reality is, and I think the jury saw right through it, is in the drug and the dope game, there are no friends. So whether the fact that they, they knew the, each other for years since they were teenagers supposedly, to me personally, if I'm sitting there as a juror with my life experience, when you have people that are dealing with drugs, money, guns, all sorts of uh, extracurricular activities, if you will, the fact that they had a prior friendship is irrelevant to me. Even though it and could I have been a possible, even though it could have been a possibility that he comes along, he's packing because you know, going into a meeting, going to a house with this guy Charles Verbagel has a lot of guns. It's all around, so he's protected think he's going to get ne negotiate, and then all chaos breaks loose, gunfire comes out, he gets shot. Isn't it not possible that he just was there thinking to do something, uh, to have a talk when really it just turned completely south and it wasn't his fault? 
Oh, it's certainly possible. There's a lot of possibilities of what occurred that evening. The victims could have been the one that initiated. Unfortunately, they're not here to tell their side of the story. Right. Uh, but again, I believe the, the the evidence was overwhelming to the point where the jury was very clear when they came down to their verdict of what they believe occurred. Absolutely. And let's just continue on, though, more with the defense's closing argument, because they did make some interesting points. Uh, unfortunately for them, it didn't work so well in their favor. Let's keep That's an important point, and I want to get back to it. So, Michael, the defense attorney made a good point. They, their determination that, and finding him guilty of the first-degree murders of these two women, they didn't believe that he fired the guns that killed them. But they do believe, under this principle theory, that he did intend for them to die nonetheless, which is interesting considering the jury had the option to find him guilty of also second-degree murder or manslaughter, which would have not required that intent for him to want these women dead. But they do believe that. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's interesting because... They certainly could have came with another theory, which is uh, available in most states here in the U.S., which is a felony murder rule, where essentially if you engage in sort of any sort of illegal felony or felonious uh, conduct that can reasonably be foreseeable to lead to someone's serious injury or death, you can be responsible for the murder just as if you were the gunman. For an example, if you're taking a friend maybe to a you know local uh, convenience store and you know that they're going in with the firearm and going to rob it, and you're quote unquote the getaway driver, if they go in there and kill that person, you can plead all day that you had no intention of anyone getting hurt, but it was reasonably foreseeable that that murder could occur and you would be held responsible under the law just if you, just as if you pulled the trigger. And in this particular circumstance. Uh, the jury came through with, I don't know, in my, in my opinion, sort of a similar justification, if you will. Yeah, no, the way that their verdict signifies to all of us that what they basically believe is Christopher Vasada is a cold-blooded murderer who wanted to kill everyone that night, that he knew what he was doing. I guess one of the things that didn't help his case is the fact that he gets shot and he's carried away. In other words, if he was just an innocent party, one of the victims, why would they decide to carry him out but really, if he's one of the shooters, if he's one of the responsible people, why was he, then obviously he was carried out. On top of the fact that so much DNA and so much of his evidence is linked to the getaway car and the vehicles and the, and the, the weapons. And that's a very smart point to bring out. If he was, quote unquote, one of the victims and a non-participant in this murder, robbery, it, um, whatever you want to categorize it as, then why would he be taken away and then later dumped when police were pursued? So absolutely a great point to put out there and something that I think would definitely be in the minds of the jurors when they went back into the deliberation rooms. Do you think the jurors also thought about the fact that he was not entirely accurate uh, in the sense he's being interviewed by police after he's shot and he says, hey, listen, I was at my friend Charles Vorpagel's house and I was a guest. Charles Vorpagel said, that's not true. So clearly the jury believed Charles Vorpagel over him. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's a tough thing for both the prosecution and the defense to deal with when you have a quote unquote star witness who shows up in uh, jail or prison fatigues. Uh, you can see that there right now on the screen, uh, this individual is spending at least eight years in federal custody for uh, the drugs and guns that were found in the home. So you've got to basically look in that uh, as that you have to look at this individual who's testifying and really hone in when you're on the defense team to basically try to get the jury to disregard his credibility based upon the crimes and the level he participated in. But again, when you're talking of cold-blooded murder, which is the topic of this trial in general, I think that drugs and guns is something that's not as high of a priority in the minds of the jury. Okay, and I'll tell you what, I'm glad you mentioned Charles Verpago because we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to go into his testimony, dissect it, and see how helpful it was to the state. We'll be back. So, Michael, how good of a witness was he for the state? I mean, do you think he fared pretty well up there? He couldn't even identify the shooters, but clearly they brought him out for a reason. 
I think he was a very important witness for the prosecution. Essentially, what he's testifying to is a lot of the important elements and factors of what was going on. First of all, the group of shooters were not invited to the party, which goes against the defense's theory that this was some sort of drug or gun transaction or business deal gone bad. Um, it shows that it was premeditated due to the fact that uh, they were just hanging out, laughing, joking, and all of a sudden they heard firecrackers, aka shots, being fired towards them, and he only had enough time essentially to fall out of his chair and run for his life. Now, the fact that he didn't remember every single detail of it is something that, as a defense attorney, you're going to harp on and try to exploit in the mind of the juries that that uh, he's, quote, unquote, full of it. Uh, but quite frankly, if you go back to the evidence that he was treated later at the hospital for shock or potentially post-traumatic stress disorder, I think that, that the prosecution can clean that up, essentially saying, hey, if you were in that position as well, having a uh, you know, a small gathering, a private gathering with family and friends, and all of a sudden shots were fired upon you, and you ran and eventually were saved and had, had no damage physically against you, that you're not going to recall every single little detail of what occurred, but the major points and facts of the firearm being shot towards you, seeing two or three figures and multiple muzzle shots is more than enough to lay out for the jury in this case. That's very well, very well said. Another point to think about is the fact that he couldn't identify the defendant and point the finger in open court and said, I saw Christopher Vasada makes him even more believable. The fact that, look, this is honestly what I saw and this is honestly what I didn't see. But let's see what happened. All right, Michael, what do you make of that testimony? The defense there trying to put the impetus on this conflict between Vorpagel and Lucas Sukis. Your thoughts? Well, it's a very interesting tactic. The way that I read into it, and I believe what the defense is trying to get out of this, um, is that they essentially, the victims uh, brought this on themselves, that he was reaching out to people in the streets, putting it out there, making it known that he was trying to have some sort of meeting with them or conflict. But again, is that realistic? I think it's very unrealistic that this individual is going to try to have an enemy, especially a drug-dealing enemy that there's going to be some sort of potential physical conflict with, to invite him to his home to either attack him at his home or, quote-unquote, resolve the conflict or do some sort of business dispute resolution. I don't buy it. At the end of the day, then, why did Christopher Vasada open fire on Charles Verpagel and the people at his house? Why did he do it? Well, that's an interesting point. I don't believe that the jury is going to have or had the, enough information to really point to one exclusive motive. Uh, I think when they sat back and they looked at the evidence, we dealt with a lot of bad players, a lot of bad actors, um, unfortunately, and it, it resulted in the death of uh, several individuals due to them being in a lifestyle of drugs and, and, and guns and all sorts of criminal yeah. activity that the jury just is not interested in. That's the tragedy of all of it, is the fact, what did these people die for? That's the thing that really just is so sad to see, especially, um, you know, these two women who were just uninvolved, were not involved in any of this conflict whatsoever. But all the deaths here are tragic. And also, if you look at Charles Verpagel, he's a young man now behind bars for federal weapons and drug charges. And now, as you just saw, Christopher Vasada found guilty and could face the death penalty. Really sad case. We're going to take a break, though. When we come back, we're going to focus on a different case because we are going to be live in the James Scandarito Jr. sentencing phase today. We'll be right back.